All right, all right, all right. Thank you, Jackie, for that introduction. And thank you all for joining us for another uh, Black Shuttered Live podcast in collaboration with IC Late Night ICP. So, uh, yeah, like Jackie said, my name is Idris Talib Solomon. I'm the uh, host and creator of the Black Shutter podcast, which is a series of conversations with black and brown photographers because uh, when I was studying photography, there were moments where I did not learn about any other black photographers. Um, and I was the only black student in my cohort. And I felt like instead of being angry at that, let me create something that celebrates the work and accolades of black photographers. And with that, sparked the Black Shutter podcast. And what's really interesting about this podcast is that this has become a form of education for me that was outside of the classroom. And it's sort of a grassroots style, it's a guerrilla style education, but I'm so fortunate to speak with so many talented um, photographers such as Ruddy, you know, a as a way to learn from their experiences um, and then share it with other people who are looking for a non-traditional form of education as well. So, Ruddy, thank you for joining us, man. I appreciate you, man. Ruddy is one of the more prolific portrait documentary photographers out there, man. If you're not familiar with his work, you will get familiar tonight. Um, there is something very special about the way he photographs people that I think everybody can learn a little bit from. And um, there's something to be said about making images that are timeless. And I know people throw that word around a lot, but I feel like a, a real timelessness when I look at his images. And I, I'm, I'm so curious about how you're able to create this sort of connection with the people you photograph. So, um, you know, tonight I hope that, you know, we're going to talk about some of your photos and you get to share a little bit about your process so that we can all walk away better human beings with a camera. All right. So, Ruddy, how you feeling out there, bro? Cold. Um, let me first thank everybody who came out tonight. Um, it's always good to look into the audience and no disrespect to nobody, but I like when people that look like me turn up. Um, it, for me, it's validation that your, your message is getting to the people who really feel comforted by your work. And more than anything else, I want people to look at my work and feel like he represented us. That kind of thing. So, so when you look in the audience and those people turn up, there's a warmth that you have. I like when my white, fo white folks turn up too. Um, I like to see my black and brown and white folks in the audience because I, I don't like to think that I'm doing divisive work. I like to think that white folks come to the work because there is a message there that they can use to go back into their communities and that we can all come together. So thank you guys for coming. And you know, to that point, the education, the photo education system, you know, when we were coming up, if if what we were learning were about how white photographers approach the craft and how they lit for white skin and things like that, we had to learn their process. And in learning their process, we still develop favorites. We still develop uh, a sense of style based on, you know, these photographers that we were studying. Um, so I think that as a craft, it's very important to learn about the work and styles of people who don't look like us, who don't come from the same place as we do, just so that we can broaden our perspective and our art. So, you know, I had the privilege of going through a few folders of your work, and that was, when I say privilege, that's a privilege, man, because um, I feel like there was a lot of work that the public doesn't normally get to see, and I'm, I was sitting there going like, yes, no, yes, no. And it's like, how do you say no to certain photos when they're all like good, right? So I'm gonna get into some of these photos, um, learn about your process. Uh, Rich, whenever you get a chance, can we go to the, the click slide show? All right. So, Ruddy, you are originally from Jamaica, Caribbean parents, right? Parish of St. James. <laughs> right. Growing up, how did your family view the arts as a career? I grew up in the arts. Um, six years old, seven years old, um, speech and drama. My mom ran 
through through her school, primary school. Um, so at six, seven, eight years old, I was learning to recite poetry in competition. So I was never this comfortable in front of a crowd. I would I would start sweating from there, and I would get up here, and I'd be nervous as hell. But once I started the poem, I'm good. So I've always been um, in speech and drama. And then my mom gave me a harmonica, which is not this. It's the piano. Well, it was called a melodica. But there was a melodica and a harmonica. And I got that at like age nine. And I went to high school at age 10. High school in Jamaica is the amalgamation of middle school and high school together. And the first thing I, I found was a recorder. And you had to bring the recorder back every day. Like The teacher was like, make sure it's back on my desk. So I went home and I made one out of PVC pipe. And the only thing that was off was the low C. And I played that thing until I joined the band, played trombone for three years, got two scholarships to go to the Indiana State University, 84 and 85, start dating myself, um, which I don't care. Um, but I've always been, my mom made sure, I think my mom looked at me and she was like, this boy will never invent a rocket. <laughs> so, so I got to give him something. And she gave me the arts. So th from a very young age, I had an appreciation for this form of expression. So I relate to that. You know, um, I grew up, my mother, I grew up in a single parent household. Um, and I feel like my mother wanted to be an artist herself. And life happened for her in the way that it did. She wasn't able to pursue that, but she made sure that she saw art. She saw me expressing the creative side and she fed that. Um, and she, you know, she helped me to get my first camera. And, um, you know, so she kind of fed my arts. Um, and I know like a lot of people, especially, you know, come from the Caribbean. I know Caribbean Americans really emphasize like the, the uh, like doc, you know, lawyer, medicine, doctor, lawyer, engineer, doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So that's why I was um, interested in knowing how your family felt about it. My mom was very, my mom was very, was very, forward thinking. I mean, before they, we started even using the word progressive, um, I've never heard my mom judge anybody. She was, every, I mean, like my carpet would, was always filled with other students from, the, from the, the neighborhood where she taught. And so I was accustomed to what social services should do. Like my mom fed what we'd call shut-ins. Mm -hmm. Shut-ins were people who couldn't come to church anymore. They were, they, were, they were either sick or old. My mom fed shut-ins. So I'm, a, I'm accustomed to a family community type of um, lifestyle. And through the arts, my mom would touch people through songs, through poetry, through whatever part of the arts. My mom was involved. I always said, like, if I ever wanted to find you, I just went up high and looked down and you'd be there. Because she always asked me, how did you find me? And I'd go, I'd just look down, look where there's a crowd of people. And and she somebody, was in the middle. Somebody in the middle going. <laughs> and I knew that that was my mom. So at what point did you pick up a camera? Like, you know, you started out with, you know, uh, words, poetry, music. Those are all, you know, uh, text-based in a sense, right? Or music-based. But photography is slightly different. It's another form of expression, but it's completely different from how you started out in art. So when did you pick up a camera? 28. 28. 28. I was, I was in college, tr finishing a, a degree in creative writing. And uh, at the time, immigration had me in, in the courts every day. Like every week, I should say. Every week I had a date. And Wait, why did I, immigration had you in the courts? Yeah. Trying to like... Because I was, yeah, because my, my status was about to be finished with one year left of college. And I was trying to extend it, and they were like, no, bro, like, go back home and do the process all over again. And so I was fighting that. And I remember I had a friend from Brazil and a friend from Argentina, and you know, those two big enemies. And I remember Giselle said to me, like, Roy, let me give you a gift. Because I guess she saw this, and she walked me to Rit 
rig, rig scammers in Washington, D.C., and she bought me a Nikon N50. A friend just bought you a, just bought you a gift. I think it was like, at the time, $200 or $300. And it was like, a sh the, the, I was about to say shitty, the, the kit lens. And then the Argentinian said, let me walk you around DC and teach you the Sunny 16 rule. Because my father photographs the, the Argentinian national team. He's a great photographer. And so Daniel walked me around DC. Um, th my first darkroom experience was in his bathroom. And I learned photography. I, I learned how to use the camera. I eventually went home at 28, um, trying to do my process. And in doing my process, I told myself that I was going to, no, I went back to the jobs I used to do before I left, which was, I was a journalist, but I did not want to write. I was like, I have this tool, let me see if I can use it. And so I ended up doing assignments for the newspaper. And one of the assignments I got was to photograph a train station with the people that were living on the train line. Because if the train was supposed to come back, where are these people going to go? So I photographed this story, and I went back to a guy I was assisting, because that's what I was trying to learn photography. I was still in learning mode. I was, all he did was to rip me out of college. But I was, my mind was still like, I need to learn this thing. And while I was learning from him, he said to me, why don't we walk the train line, Montague Bay to Kingston, it's 121 miles, and you can learn, and I'll photograph it as a project. And while he's there, I'm, 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 I'm looking through magazines. I'm looking at what the exposure, 125th of a second at 5, 5.6. What does that mean? What does the light look like? Da, 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 da. And I started to learn. And, and I'm using slide film. I'm not using transparencies. I'm not using, I'm using, you got to get it or you, you don't have it. And I did that for 21 days. Walk the, walk the subway line. Walk the, the, the train, train, line, line. train line. Actually, drop dude, because he was like, you should stop photographing. You should, you should just write. Because he started to see the value in this project. And, and I was just like, you know what? I'll do it myself. And I walked the, entire, the rest of the, the line by myself, learned the word reciprocity. So for all you students, if you conquer the word reciprocity, you understand photography. And the moment I learned that my, my entire world bloomed, just that one word. And I haven't looked back. That, that word was it. That was my entry. So I definitely want to get back to what that word means to you as we look through some of your photos. But I'm, I'm also interested in what happened when your friend bought you that camera and walked you around DC. Like, what about that experience told you, let me stick with this device. Let me, this something Great magical happening with Great this question. device. I, I can, let me stick with it. It happened in the store. In the store. In the store. I took up the camera. Remember, I'm a writer. So for me, where it's flow, it's water, it's, it's either swash or backwash. It goes out, it comes back. There's a flow to writing for me. And I remember taking up the camera, looking outside. There was a guy that was walking and I snapped, saw what I took, but then he walked out of the frame. And I go, oh, I can capture a piece of something. Like, I don't have to tell, I don't have to have this constant flow. I can actually just deal with that moment. And that was the, in photography. That was actually the shift. So, looking at these photos, um, what about these two kids prompted you to photograph them? Um, Sule, funny enough, Sule is now a budding actor in, in London. And my niece on the other, on the other is like, what, 21 now? Um, at the time, I was, I remember when I visited, I visited Jamaica. This is actually in Jamaica. I visited Jamaica. And I heard some of the affluent members of my society 
refer to this beach as nigger beach. And I was like, what? And I, it's, like, it's like I invited you to, to Jamaica. I had, I had, I had a, a, a guy who I used to rock with. He heard it, and you know, an African-American is going to hear the word nigger. Somebody in the Caribbean who heard the word nigger kind of think of it completely different. Um, there's a different tinge to it. And dude was about to like go rock these guys, and I'm like, no, no, their fathers have guns. You don't want to. And I remember in that moment, because if you know anything about this beach, Jamaican beaches, especially the free beaches, always get full around East, around holiday time, where all the folks who live in the, the farmlands, in the hills, they come down to the beach in droves, in buses, and they have a good time. These dudes were saying that the water got brown because these folks were coming on. And the more they, the more, and I listened. Before I said anything, I just listened to where they characterized farmers, people from the hills. And I photographed this beach for five years. I refused to go to the tourist beach. Um, and for me, it was about, there's always this thing. I remember when I, I, I went to Katrina, I went to Katrina because Harry Belafonte said, the reason America took so long to go to Katrina was because the South, the South is filled with forgotten people. And so for me, those, those two words, forgotten people, I was like, I need to go look at forgotten people. Here, Nigger Beach, for me, was I need to go photograph people who you consider to be niggardly. Um, and everybody who knew me knew that if you know me, you have to go to Nigger Beach. You can't, you can't say anything to me about the tourist beaches because you're going to get my, my anger, my wrath. And so every time, I would just start photographing people who were on the beach. And I wanted, I dared you to look at that person and go, nigger. Like, there's nothing special. But there, there are other images where there are shower caps. There are women who bathe in their underwear, in their bra. And it speaks to a class of, of, of folks. But I dare you say that they're niggers. And, you know, I saw some of those images um, in your folder. And what it looks like also is uh, it speaks to class, but it also speaks to a certain comfort level that they have, where they can show up as themselves, enjoy the beach. It's not the touristy beach, but it's their beach, right? And they, and they enjoy amongst their I like their that community. word, their beach. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that was what was most beautiful about their expression, that they claimed it. It was their beach. Mm -hmm. And it was also free. Yeah. And um, so w one thing that stood out to me about these two portraits out of the many that I saw um, is that you photograph these two young people the same way that you photograph the uh, elders or even like people in mid middle age, right? And there is this um, just honesty in it, you know? So um, that's why I wanted to um, speak about these two photos in particular. But um, I know that hmm. you have been listed as, you know, one of the 50 greatest street photographers. Um, it's a huge accolade, you know, um, huge honor. Um, when did you, so I know you, you said you, you, you walked this up, there was the train line in, um, in Jamaica documenting, right? But how did you know, like, this camera was a, a personal expression for you, like, that can separate the writing part of you and, and just kind of shift over to the visual side of you. Because you think I'm taking pictures. I'm still writing. I, I have not stopped writing. This, pic this picture is not about the picture. It's about me being able to talk about the picture. So every image that I take, it's not real. I mean, like, it's understanding aesthetics, understanding composition, understanding what makes a good picture. But in my mind, the words are like they, they're hungry to come out. I, I'm dying to tell you about w how I felt when I saw these pictures. So it's it's not necessarily for me. Uh, there the, the, the two ways that I look about 
what I do, or I, I, I talk about what I do. I usually call myself a reggae artist who takes pictures, or a writer who takes pictures. I, I do not, it, it, the, the picture taking or the, the, the visual, the image making does not supersede my writing. I, or I still think that I'm a writer. You know, I believe that uh, the camera only magnifies who we are as individuals, right? So if somebody is interested in uh, food, right? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody is a chef. Um, and they, they love cooking, but then they pick up a camera and they learn the technical part of the camera, then now they, are, they start taking pictures of the food that they make. Now you have this whole new genre of food photography, mm -hmm. right? And it's just like, but the camera is only magnifying their love of food, mm -hmm. you know? Um, seeing an image like this and, you know, being a photographer myself, I know that there are moments when I go out and I make photos, I make photos, and I'm in the zone, and it's not until I get back home to my machine and I start looking through the photos that I actually remember what happened when I was taking the photos. Mm -hmm. You say like, you don't stop writing, you wanted to express something in this image. Mm -hmm. Like how do you, what's the question? Um, in the blink of an eye, in a situation like this that happens so fast, how conscious of are you of the, the moment that you're documenting. We, earlier we were having a story talk, a conversation about these books yes. and what these books have meant to me. In all these books, you can find, I'm sure you can find an image like this. It's here, like, and, and, and you can have a debate over, you know, are you duplicating what's in the book? What it does for me is I can see this picture developing a hundred years before it gets to me. Like, I raise my camera because I know what is going to, it's not my choice to either shoot what is in the book or photograph what's in the book or photograph the next picture from what's in the book. So th 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 this is why I, uh, like, I do have like three bookcases of books because I have a reservoir to, 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 to draw from. Like I, my, my mind, sees the images and my job is to just like that guy that was walking across in the frame to pick the frame that i want so that i can talk about it um and that, it for me it makes it easy because in this in this picture the dog walking through the image made the picture for me because as a jamaican even though there are dogs on the street there is you, there's this understanding that you do not you do not walk where dogs walk. You're not you're not going to be where dogs are because dog a dog, as we said, dog a dog and human a human. Simple <laughs> as that. Um, so this image for me was about politicians who only come around when they need your vote, um, where a little girl has to play around, because on the other side that you can see is they were actually painting the neighborhood. And it's so funny that I'm, I'm about to say this, which I hated. Because the money that they got, you, you're going to paint the neighborhood? Like there's so much more you could have done with that money. But it was easy to have a bunch of painters go in, just like what they have in um, Williamsburg, where these like, guys... You mean like murals? They put these murals up, and I was just like, and she was just watching, she was just standing there watching. And I'm like, yeah, but that money could have moved that garbage. Mm -hmm. So you said you have this reservoir of images from like some of the books that you study. And you're pretty sure like there's an image like this in some of those books. The images of this young girl um, on the street with like a bunch of garbage in front of her. Um, and it's almost like that. That's the same photo exists in East New York in Brooklyn, or it exists in somewhere in Cleveland. Right? I can, I can it, tell you that Leica no longer talks to me because an, of an image exactly like this, mm -hmm. where I saw it go up on Instagram. I called, I didn't call, I, I, I DM'd saying, this is not proper. And it was a girl that was photographed in garbage in City Soleil. 
and she was dancing or, or moving in a, in a manner that seemed like she was dancing and like I had it as a, an advertising. And I was just like, no. No, 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 not with my people. Exploitative. Yeah, 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 yeah. Find another image. Mm -hmm. So I know, I mean, I don't, can't, I don't take an image and go, oh my God, this is, this is a really special. I n there's nothing new under the sun. It's what can I, t how can I speak about this image that's going to be different from how it exists anywhere else? And also, what do you want that image to say for you when you're no longer here to, to talk, talk about it? Facts. Right? That's why I marry, if you look at my Instagram, I marry words with imagery. Because I know that there's going to be a time where I'm no longer here to defend or to talk about this image. And that's why the book has to come out. <laughs> Working on it. So... What I love about your work, and especially being having an opportunity to go through, you know, hundreds of your photos, um, there's this consistent feeling that everybody you photograph has like a deeper story to them, right? Because we all do. No, nobody here is, you know, this at surface value, right? Like right. there's always something deeper happening. Um, but what you do looks like you catch somebody. You f like you freeze them right in the middle of a deep thought, like they're having a very, very private moment, and you're there at the height of that that moment that they're experiencing, and you press the shutter. You know, um, what is it about you and how you approach the craft that allows you to connect with people through your camera? We've, it's, it's a conversation that Rebecca and I have all the time, like. Um, Rebecca and I have been on the road for four years, um, just trying to do stories, trying to tell stories in a deeper way. And sometimes she has colleagues who ask the same question, how does Ruddy get that image? And I think it was best illustrated last week where it's deep snow, Still a little cold in Cleveland. I drove down to these two tents that I've been watching. And I th I'm, I'm, I'm also going back to shooting. It's actually right by, um, across the street from Cleveland Print Room. There's a two tents there right where there's a heat, the heat, a heat vent. I just watch, like, I think about them when I'm not, when I'm not down there. And as soon as it gets warm enough to go down there, I go down there and I just park the, the truck and I just watch. Um, sometimes people pass by and they give them food. And I saw this guy come across with his bicycle. His name is Robert. And I'm... And Robert um, turned around and he asked me, what are you doing? And I go, he said, are you a journalist? And I go, yeah, but not today. Like, today, I'm trying to tell your story. And I remember Rebecca and I were talking on the phone, and I went up to Rebecca, and I said, Rebecca, tell, tell um, Robert what just happened to me. Robert said, the, the, be the beautiful line that got me, that pulled me into the picture, I think the idea of taking a picture, was he said, during the pandemic, I lost my backbone. And that was it. I was like, okay, I need to photograph this dude. And I said, Rebecca, tell him, because he won't hear it from me, that the bank came for my truck. Like, woke up one morning in the bank, took it. Your truck, or this but, is Robert saying this? No, no, no. The bank came for my truck. Okay. Um, and so I said to Robert, we're here. Like, we might be completely two different spaces in our life, but the idea that we're both struggling, hustling, trying to figure out how to do this, we're at that intersection. Robert starts to smile. And then he goes, can you take me to West 25th over by uh, Meyer Street? Um, right, actually, up the road from um, the new CPR building. And um, in two seconds, he fell asleep. And I actually wanted to drive to New York so that he could get a proper sleep. In two seconds, this man was like, oh. and when I got to Myers, I kind of like, he gave him a little 10 minutes more 
So like, that's all he needed. He came out, he didn't ask me for a dime. He was going to go to a plasma center to give blood, to get 60 bucks. That connection is why the images are like that. I have never gone up to somebody and it has, it has only been, let me take a picture. Because that's transactional, right? That's it. it has always been about a conversation. And it's not, we're not even talking about depth. We're talking about meeting somebody where they are and, 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 and allowing yourself to sit in it. Like, like all he wants. And I had the heat up. It was, he was good. <laughs> That's why the picture looks the way it is. All right. So now, 2024, everybody has a camera, right? Everybody has a camera. Um, You're going to get me in trouble. Everybody has a phone. You're going to get me in trouble. There's, you know, but because everybody has a camera and everybody has a camera in somebody's face, not everybody approaches making portraits with that sort of sensitivity, right? So what is it about you that pushes you to connect with folks so that they can be genuine and honest and vulnerable like that right there is the key because i'm i'm thinking about the, that little girl or that little boy that's sitting a hundred years in the future 50 years in the future waiting for my work to be done so that they can push it forward and that work is going to go there without my voice it's going to go there and i have to season it with enough so that when they get it and they put it on the grill they can go this brother used pimento. I can taste the pimento in this. I don't want to just, I mean, I don't, I mean I'm not, I keep wanting. can't watching. just be salt and pepper. I, you see it. <laughs> I really want, I really want to use the S-H-I-T word. Can I? Like, is that? Shit. Yeah, there you go. Um, like, it can just be the same old, like, you go to these restaurants and you, there's no seasoning. I want you to I want I want you to, to be like and it's like a a whole fet in your mouth. That's I want you to look at an image and just feel and know and 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 have a have the person has a name. Like it's just not the man. And so yeah, like that's that that's how I do work. I have looked at all of this. You you said that it's overwhelming to go through social media. I see shit. But I also understand, because we talk about it all the time, fast food has produced fast food photography, music, clothes. Like, the other day they honored Dionne Warwick. And I immediately was like, you know, let me just, let me just do a little Dionne Warwick rendition. Because, you know, you never know. And I listened to Dion's um, little, little, what, what's the word? The breath of music, her, her, catalog. her catalog. Mm -hmm. I listened to it for like, I gave her like a good 30 minutes. They don't make music like that no more. You know, it's, it's, it feels like this. You hear, you hear the newest YG or the newest whatever, and in two weeks, you listen to the next, the next. The next. And I don't want to do photograph photographs like that. So at home I'm I cook a lot, right? Um and my wife makes fun of me because Salt I cook and pepper. Slow. Salt and pepper? Nah man, pimento. There you go. All right. <laughs> yeah. So my wife makes fun of me because I'm it, I I cook more but I cook slow sometimes. But I'm like, but I'm cooking with love. Got right? it. And I, I wanna make sure like every bite from whatever is the rice to the sauce to the protein or whatever, like everything tastes good throughout, right? Layers of flavor. So I understand exactly what you're saying. And to apply that approach to photography, to have layers and depth and uh, nuance to the images is very, Texture. very powerful. Like Context. you can't just, it's not. So I think the reason why photography has sort of exploded in the last few years is because so many people feel like it's easy to just pick up a camera and press a button, and now like they're a legend, right? Mm -hmm. And there's so many, so many uh, 
decisions that go into making a photo. And not even just the decision part is, sometimes you have to decide not to make a photo in order to make the photo next time, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. in the situation with Robert, right? Mm -hmm. You you know you today that you said today I'm not a journalist I'm just here and you you sit in your truck I and told, you observe. I told her I, I kept saying to her I, I I have I didn't make a good picture today like I and it was okay because what he got was way better. He he gave me his number. He said he's always here and there and I'm like I got you. I'll come find you. Beautiful. But before before you cook, do you know where do you know where the love you put in the food comes from? This is this is some old woman saying right now. Go Do you know where the love comes from? Tell me. The the sweat. You know, people talk about food. It, there's a reason why you wash your hands all the time while you're handling food. You secrete the the the, the, the that you do to food. Mm -hmm. The love comes from your pores into the food. Like that's where it comes from. There's no there's no energy that. So it's like a love hormone that's like being like, secreted like, into the but food. So, so imagine, imagine, which is why when you go to restaurants, you should not like, oh Lord, like you. <laughs> um. So let's say you had a shitty day. Yeah. You go home. You're angry. What do you think you're gonna put in that food? What do you think you you if you're if you're not using a glove, if you're using your hand into your food, you marinate your meat, you you wash your veggie, you you're preparing. What do you think it comes from here? Mm -hmm. A woman in Congo told me. So, yeah, hear that? Who's going home? Look, who's going home to cook after this? <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, this photo right here stopped me in my tracks. This black and white photo of this older gentleman looking through, uh, you know, wooden windows. Uh, where was this taken? Um, I'm, I wanted I wanted to say the place, but I won't be able to. But I, so I'll say it was in St. James. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually in the hills on my way to my mom. So every summer, my mom would take me and my sister to El Dursley in St. Elizabeth. Um, she felt like it was important to give us country life, um, to give us community, um, to give us pit toilet. There's no flush. Like, imagine eating some of the best food in the world. And at 9 o'clock, <laughs> that food started to talk to you. There's more. Between 6 and 9, the whole family was telling you some Duppy story. You know what Duppy is? Ghost. Ghost. So every creak you hear, you know, and then come nine o'clock, come nine o'clock, the pit toilet is outside. <laughs> and we have no electricity. This is lamp. And my mom is not going to bring the lamp, walk the lamp with you to the pit toilet. She stands on the veranda and she says, it's over there, so just, just follow, just follow. And so you're like, and you leave the door crack. Because you're not closing that door. Man. So I think, I think, because even now, when I, when, when my, I have two sons, when they say something, I remind, I'm like, dude, you have no idea. Like, you, 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 you bathe with rainwater. Rainwater is not something where it, the soap washes off of you. Like, it feels slippery. And so you're like, and it no leave you stuff like that but the kitchen was also outside where there was smoke this and smoke that and there's nothing man, with, in, in the country the food is called bickle like when you hear the community say hey, we're coming for some bickle and you're like mm -hmm. you know but you always think about 9 o'clock you always mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe not but yeah like it was, to her, that was important, that lesson, to see people. I remember the first, I can't use that word, so I have to use Marina. Does anybody know what Marina is? I can't use the other word. The other word is double B. You know what that word is, everybody? You know the, the white, you know the white? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be boom, boom, boom. You know what I'm saying? Right. So every every Caribbean boy, I think, under even though I still wear a shirt under a shirt, like I had bronchitis, so my mom would always put put, put one of those marinas on me. I remember the first time I, I was in the country, and I there was a kid running up to me, and I grabbed him, and I let him go. My white thing was brown. And I think my mom wanted to see my reaction. And my reaction was, cool, let's go eat cane. Boom. She wanted to make sure that I did not have no class issue. Um, you go to the country, so most of those people don't have no. I don't think, I, I, you have to also understand, you, Jamaican people criticize. Like, and, and the kids are not afraid to go. Because I remember one day I was walking with my mom, and I have to share this story. It might sound vulgar. And there was this woman in 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, sunlight in a leather pants. And I remember turning to my mom and I said, Mommy, listen, I'm about nine. I'm not yet, because at 10 I went to high school, and I'm nine. I said, Mommy, are something no hot? <laughs> just like that, like, ju like it just came out. Like there was no filter. No, so, so I can imagine taking me to the country and seeing people without two teeth. I'll be like, "Mommy, how are them out? They look so." And I think that was the kind of education where class didn't matter. Coming from a different, you're from the city. Like that was the lesson. Like you're supposed to learn how to to not shame anybody. That kind of thing. So. So, so that, it translates exactly, to exactly how I see people in photography. Yeah, and that is a humility that mm -hmm. your mother instilled mm -hmm. in you, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, that, was, that was like a great story arc to kind of get back to how you tie all of that into your work, you know. Um, so I know right now you are currently in Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, I met you in New York randomly. Like I remember um, on that. I don't know if you remember this. It was like on Atlantic Avenue. You were buying some soccer stuff for your kids. This is years ago. Um, so I know you have roots in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. You lived in New York, and now you're currently in Cleveland, Ohio. Right? Mm -hmm. Tell us the difference that you see making photos in those th in the middle of America. Like, tell us the difference. Um, you see making photos in those three different types of locations? Um, people always say that when I go back to Jamaica, I photograph with love. I don't see it. Like, I don't, I don't love, mm, well, mmm, mmm. Make sure I don't lie here. I was about to use the F word. Jeez, um, I'm, I've been having a really tough time in Cleveland. So let me just put that to the court, put that to the side. Um, but, Jamaica just feel like food and music and and air and my body's regular. There's beach. I smell the salt and and so I photograph with the, the level of familiarity. Um, New York. Me, I I've been photographing New York. I photographed New York for twenty years. It got to the place where when I looked out into New York, I was like, this looks sterile and dead. Like, it just didn't feel edgy anymore. And I got a job in Cleveland four years ago. And when I got to, to and this, I had to parachute in, and I got a week or a week and a half, two weeks max, I felt like I could get my Eggleston on. Anybody know who William Eggleston is? See? We're going we're, we're to be teaching up in here. All right. Uh, or who else, who else did I admire? Will, William Eggleston photographed Memphis, um, mostly color, got a lot of money from Guggenheim for <coughs> bullshit. <coughs> um, <laughs> but still, he, he, he made money. I'm not making none. But he, um, I wanted to do that in Cleveland. And I felt like I could do that because for two years, I was allowed to do that. Um, but in Jamaica, we ever say, see me and come live with me are two different things. 
Um, I got there and I, you drive 45 minutes outside of Cleveland and then you see a lot of American flag. A lot of American flag. And people looking at you like, Sam, how do they look at me? Yeah, like, 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 what are you doing over here, bro? Like, uh, and, and, and you come to find out, um, there are eight sundown towns in Ohio. Um, Sandusky has the most repositories. It's a repository of Confederate, has the most Confederate statues outside of the Confederacy. So I remember one day I called my son and he was like, he's on a tr school trip in Sandusky. And I said, put your, I said, go find your principal. Put him on the phone. And the principal is black. I said, did you know that Sandusky has the largest repository of Confederate statues outside of the Confederacy? He said, I didn't know that. I said, Could you, what time are you, t what time are you like getting my son out of there? He's like, we only have about two more. I said, yeah, then hurry, hurry up. Because you don't want the ugly ruddy. Um, so I've, it, it's been tough in the sense that I don't feel the sense of freedom that I had in New York. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I got up early this morning to move my car, and I drove to an, uh, uh, a knife sharpening place. And the whole time, I was like, I wish my son could photograph in New York. Because it's everywhere. Like, you make images everywhere. The city moves. Um, in Cleveland, it's different. Like, it's like, you can photograph, but you have to go to East Cleveland, which is its own entity. Cleveland is its own city mm -hmm. inside of Cleveland. There's like East Cleveland, right? East Cleveland is its own city inside of Cleveland. Um, then you have other spaces around like Shaker or um, West, West, West Cleveland? Is it this what it's called? Like Lakewood, West Lakewood area. All right, so the, and, and Denison, you have to go outside to go find. But I find it harder, especially when, because people are now very, they know what photography is. Back in the days, you could like hold up a camera and people would be like, happy. Mm -hmm. Now they're like, Yo, you're gonna put me up on, in TikTok, or you're gonna put me up on Instagram, and like, I don't know what, you, I don't know what you're gonna, you can move my head, da 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 da. Um, so, it has changed a lot, but I, I find that my way works. Sit down, introduce yourself, have a conversation. This is what I want to do. I'd love to invite you to collab collaborate with the series that I'm doing. I love to use those words. Um, love and collaborate. I love to use collaborate and series. series. People like to be a part of a body of work mm -hmm. um, as, opposed, as opposed to a one-off. And I love to use the word collaborate as opposed to, what's that word that people like to use? So who said it? There you go. That means you've heard me say this before. So these, are some, these are some very predatory words. So, so yeah. some of the words, I don't know if the microphone picked it up. Some of the words that were mentioned were uh, subject or capture, um, right. shoot. I don't, shoot. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't learning. Use, I'm I like I'm getting better. I'm getting man, better. I, I say it a lot, but I'm like, I catch myself every time. The times I use the word shoot, I'm very conscious, and it's usually when I'm speaking to somebody who is just so much quicker to communicate it than to go this roundabout way. Like, it might be like someone older mm -hmm. who, they just need to understand what I'm talking about. Right. But for people who are aware, I, I don't say shoot, especially if most of the work that I make or most of the work you make is featuring black folks. Like if the image on this screen right now is this young man outside of this house, wow. and if I ask you, um, what what made you decide to shoot this 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 boy right in front of his house? He died last year. This this young man was killed last wow. year. We dro we drove into where was it? Um, New Iberia, New Iberia, Louisiana, and here's the thing. So we we drive into we drive into communities, and you see you see the like the guys packing. And I remember when we, 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 went to, we went to the Pokemon Beans, um, we circled once. And on the second time we circled, 
everybody had their machines out. Because they didn't know who you were. There you go. So I pulled up. I didn't go down there. I pulled up, and I came out of the, the truck, and I lifted up my shirt, and I walked in. It was utter love. Immediately. Like, the moment we started to talk, I was adopted. Immediately. Same thing with this. So we went over, we got into this community. We were actually maybe two corners around from here. And I was saying, you know, I'm trying to, this street looks different. So they removed some of the, that's actually a, a slave home. That, your ancestors lived in that house. Like our ancestors lived in these, these houses. They were slave homes. And for me, how do you, how, how do you feel as a person living in the home that your ancestors, so a lot of my photography is about the psyche also, like how do we carry that weight with us? So before I tell you how I got here, I went into the community, I saw a bunch of people, they had no idea who I was, and I showed them this image. And I said, I was here such and such and such a year. And they go, oh my God, they killed him last year. And everybody just like, send me that picture, send me that picture, send me that picture, send me that picture. Um, and this, when I, when I went to photograph this area, he was the only person who wasn't feeling me. He stayed away. Like you can see it in his energy. He stayed away and I just kept talking to everybody else. And he kept inching me, listening. I was, I'm doing the. <laughs> See, it's, it's, it's the culture. And it got to the point where he, I talked about me photographing the GDs and the BDs in, in, in Chicago. What's that? Um, gangster Disciples and Black Disciples. Okay. Two faction, two gang, gang, different gangs who were warring against each other. And he immediately go, oh, he's one of us. Okay, he could trust you now. Got this image. And like, it still felt tight, but he said yes. You can photograph me. And did you have that? So I know like there's this cardinal rule in photojournalism where you don't ask to take somebody's portrait or whatever. Like, did you that's what I heard, you know. Um Okay, so, so do you do you ask people? Two different there's two different schools. There is portraiture, which is what you did today. Ready, I'd like to take a picture. Uh, and, and you do, you do when you sit here, say, that's portraiture. Mm -hmm. And then there's journalism where you don't talk, you move, you shepherd, you shuffle, you try to get. And I do that with a lot of my street stuff. Like I see a sign on the wall or I see a picture that's coming and the two pictures are going to come together. And I just center myself and I wait and I go, Shh. um, this is a portrait. Um. You don't have to tell the person to pose. You just go, can I take a picture? And I'm ready. I set up. And then they go. And I'll either go, no, give me three quarters. But I'm not, gonna, I'm not telling him to put his hand in his pocket. I'm sure there's something in here he doesn't want. Put me your to hood see. on and put your hand in your pocket. No, right? I'm sure there's something in his, in his hoodie he doesn't want me to see. Mm -hmm. And so that's why his hand is in me. And I'm, I'm like. So you stay as minimal as that's possible. That's possible. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's journalism. It's a portrait. Well, I'm sorry to hear that this, this young man is um, no longer with us. Um, that's, you know, it's fucked up. Um, oh, he used the F word. That means I can use the F word. There we go. Let it fly. Um, but no, I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm glad that you were able to make this photo, and it sounds like there are people in his in his community who were happy that you took the photo as well, because now they have something to remember him by. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's one of those things where it's a reminder of the work that we do, right? It's a reminder of the work that we do. I remember speaking to Jamel Shabazz, and he said that he's documented for so many years, and he, somebody reached out to him and said, that picture you just posted, that was my uncle, or that was my cousin, or that was my auntie, or whatever, and they just passed. And this is the only photo that I have of, mm -hmm. of them, mm -hmm. of their memory. Mm -hmm. um, so to, to hear that you're making images in a similar vein, 
just speaks to the power of, of this craft, but also the fact that you're able to see something special in this young man to, to decide to take his picture and wait and wait him out. Because mm -hmm. he, he, he was sniffing you out, making sure like he could trust you. But I, I, I don't live by an image. Like if I had left there without the image, I don't, there's, there's only one image to this day. It, was, it happened at the Pork and Beans, believe it or not. That I would, I would have posed it just to have it. I went to, I went to a park, they were playing ball. And there was a kid with a AR-15 in his waist. And he does this. And caught a football with the AR-15 in his waist. And I was so far, but I saw it. And I was like, oh my God, can you, if I had that pic, that picture alone, I would have just burnt every other picture I've taken. An AR-15 in his waist, and he's like Crazy. reaching for a football. Do you know what you're talking, you're talking about the fact that he doesn't feel comfortable enough to go play, but he has to play. And also, that Ooh. has me thinking about all the young people who are, who have aspirations of making it to the professional level mm -hmm. who are in very similar situations. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's either go pro or go street. And, and that's what I, I get from that, that mm -hmm. visual also. Um, I know, like, there's, there's, a, there's a lot. We're only on the sixth photo or the fifth photo, right? And there's a lot I want to get through. We're not going to get through all of them because it's so, these photos are so heavily laced with stories and experiences. But, we're gonna try. All okay. Right? So, Ooh. one thing I found interesting going skip, through your skip work. One. one thing I found. Thank Ooh. you. One thing I found interesting going through your work. It was this series of flags, American flags, right? And I don't know if you saw it when you sent the body of work, but I it's something you, I told you. Yeah. I said I sent you a series of flags. So that's my mistake. I, I did. I overlooked that. But yes, I feel like traveling through the U.S. I've been in, even in Brooklyn, I've been down certain blocks where there's nothing but like U.S. flags waving. And this is in Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a different icon when I see the flag in the U.S. <laughs> than if I'm abroad and I see the flag, right? Mm -hmm. And to me, I don't feel comfortable, right? So... Looking through this body of work, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to uh, fast forward through a few just so you see this collection of images with the flag, and then we'll go back and talk through them. But when I see pictures of... Let's pause here. Because this is... There, there's In my life, I, I don't have favorite images. But in my life, I have... There's some images that I've taken where I'm like, like the, the gods, like they, look, they didn't just pour. They put the whole goblet over their shoulder and just, just and I was under there going, yes. The rainwater. Um, so how many people grew up in the church here? So you, you know that at the, at the end of um at the end of the ser the sermon the pastor usually call what what is that thing he call he does quick naughty altar call altar call altar like come on let me see a view come up up front there so yeah right true or false um especially when they said anybody who's coming here for the first time they're expecting you to come up to the front and get the little so, what are they usually hoping that you'll do? Repent. Repent of your sin and be saved. No, so. So, what is over on this side? Right? Who has been our God for the past couple of years? He's in the middle there. Say name. Him. Him who is able to change black lives matter to black lives war and you see that white hand that runs across all the way to the edge what is on his mouth the american flag 
that to me, you, I mean, like, like the whole goblet. To have to be touched so that he saved from being Black Lives Matter to Black Lives Matter because he repented. He became one of us. Rebecca says it more eloquently when she writes. Um, but yeah, that's, that, this is this image. You know, last night I was watching this movie, this documentary called um, The Greatest Night in Pop. It was where all of the, in the 80s, like 1985, all the biggest pop singers in the world or in the U.S., um, got together to make We Are the World, mm -hmm. right? Harry, Balaf Harry, Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte was one of the artists, and you quoted him earlier. It's funny because when I was watching that film, there was he had another quote that I wanted to read. Boom. It, it felt perfect for our conversation, right? So he says, we believe that artists have a valuable function in any society since it is the artists who reveal the society to itself. Mm-hmm. And that quote felt so timely last night as I'm preparing for this conversation because I feel like you are that artist that is showing, you're holding the mirror up to society so society can look at the reflection and, 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 and question what's happening. And in these images, you know, I feel like... Stop here. This one? No, no, the next one. This one. This one. Yes. So... This this is this is called black and blue, as in I wrote it. I wrote this during the the the, the, the days or the months or the years when police was just putting it on, and some of us would live, some of us would die. But for me, black and blue, and I said black and blue do not mix. From the beginning, they have stood betwixt the sun and the moon, the same way midnight scorns the noon. Black boy restrained and imprisoned without a say. Old, while old white hands, who meant to have him as a slave, who meant to have him slave his life away. Fashioned coins from his blackness and true equalities delayed. Black and blue mixed only on street corners and highways, handcuffed on back streets and alleyways. Black boy killed on a rooftop or a dark stairway finds no justice, even when the video show, shows foul play. Black boy thinking that snitching and mixing only makes our blues darker. Water it down, make it lighter. Again, using old white hands, architects of a gray land, dip their greedy palms into native red, mixing it with black. The clotted mixture of a putrid lineage leaks out when black faces hit concrete or get covered with dirt. An assimilated heritage. White and blue strangle the starry dreams of a black boy with their institutional stripes, discoloring the perfect blend of black on red, on white, on blue. And every day we rise, we see our blue LCD screens alight with another casted image of another black boy's die. That is this. You wrote that for this, for I this image? I wrote that for this. You know, when I saw this image, this is one of my favorite images of yours, and um, I'd never associated the, the poem with it, um, but what I see in this image is that this, this young black man is obscured by the American flag, mm -hmm. right? And some of what you have going on in some of these other images, like this image here in particular, is this young man behind a screen door or, or, or a window screen and the, the flag is obscured again and this hole in the screen where is the only way we see him clearly is it feels like he's on the outside looking in. Black men on the outside looking in to... On the inside that can't come out. Exactly, right? So it's like there's so much complexity with, with the black experience and this U.S. flag because we know that we built this country mm -hmm and we don't get to enjoy all of the liberties of this country, mm -hmm. right? And there's this whole, you know, a lot, of, a lot of photographers say they're storytellers, and I want to challenge them a lot because it just feels like they are not always thinking about all the details in a photo, right? But what I see, the storytelling I see in, in, in your photos, in this image in particular, right, 
is this young boy sitting on the swing, and the swing has this metal chain, right? So I automatically start to associate this black this black boy with a chain, mm -hmm. right? And the chain is casting a shadow on his face. And you know, when you look at enough photos, or when you go out and you make enough photos, you're aware when shadows and things are casting on people's face. You mm -hmm. can either you could have chose to take a step to the side mm -hmm. and not have his face mm -hmm. in that shadow, right? But I then I could have told him get up. Yeah, right. But this look that he's giving, and then you have like the Jesse Owens Ooh. in the background with the flag. You know, it's just it's so it's so layered. And then that I feel like there's a whole lot of storytelling happening because you're you're giving us like these little clues and these. He's a kid, Looney Tunes. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked this. It's crazy. Easter 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 Sunday. I saw three three. There were three of them, um, and I asked them a bunch of questions. And this kid asked me, "Do I believe in God?" And I was like, "Yeah, but damn, how old are you?" Asking me them big questions. And I said, I said, what, what does God look like? And he goes, God is white. And I was like, oh, my God. I have work to do. Like, I didn't know I was going to come out here Easter Sunday doing all this kind of work. I said, mm. where do you get that from? He goes, TV. And in that moment, I knew, I was just like, I, this is why I do this. Because I have to now go erase the power of the TV. So he saw, he saw all his God shows, white Jesus, white God. And it's funny, I do have the, 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 the reels here because I taped it. One kid, there were three of them, one kid said, no, God is black. And so I said, who told you that? Because God did. <laughs> I was like, dude, you just saved this. <laughs> But there. that, and this is this is at the Othway projects in um. They have demolished that building, and so. He's gone. Mm -hmm. Um. But there's a shoot. I mean, like, there there's so many of these kids. I remember I went down, I went down there to photograph, and this kid walked up to me, and he goes, "You know you can't, you know you can't be down here like you have those two cameras like, like you can't be here without a gun." And I go, I'm okay. I didn't tell him that, dude. I'm, 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 I'm good. You know, what I mean? say it, say it for me. There you go. I didn't tell him, but he was like, you can't be here. So I get there a Friday evening about five o'clock, and a mom said, if you were here three hours earlier, there were four kids, kids their size that were shoot had shootouts. The last day I went to Othwaite, I drove up, and there's a group of kids that I always see, that I always found. Um, I remember a couple of times I've left there, like, help us get some McDonald's, and I'm like, buy a couple of meals. Something was funky. I didn't get the dap. I didn't get the, you know what I'm saying? I didn't get the love. Like, I didn't, I didn't feel it. So I was like, ooh, something kind of off. Um, so something just said, pull off. Something said, pull off, leave. And I drove three blocks up and turned around, came out, and just look. Those guys went in, and about four guys in shiesty came out. And I was like, really? The thing is, I don't believe just because you got that thing, you got to use it. I mean, I drove off. But I'm like, they were about to like. So that was the, my last day. They're about to rob you. What you, did? I, um, did you hear me? Let me maybe I drink some water. Maybe I'm stuttering. I'm not, I don't. Yeah. They went in, came back out, and we're we're like this. The tr the van was up the road. So I was just like, last day. All right, I'm good. I'm all right. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what makes you keep going into situations? Those, those two kids. Which ones? The ones that are talking about God? No. The ones that are up there waiting for me to finish the work. A hundred years from... They're sitting there. Ready. Come. Chop, chop. Get it. Come, 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 come. Get it done. 
We need it so that they can carry it. People ask me the same question. How do you, what motivates you? What gets you up in the morning? What makes you continue? Because truthfully, that situation is something that stops me. Like I'm like, why am I doing this when my own people will rob me? Even worse. Let's say I'm like, you know, you're not getting this camera. Why am I still doing it? Because I know that there's some people up, up there waiting for the work. So, ironically, this is one of the photos that, you know, I've, I've added to the discussion as well. And, you know, this is a, I don't want to say great follow-up, that's not the word, but I think it's a proper follow-up to the story we just told because this image of this this young black man with a skull and crossbone on his shirt, you have this advertisement behind him, Red Dead Redemption, and it's like this cowboy aiming a gun. It looks like he's, he's aiming a gun at him. You know, um, it's so much violence in this photo, even though this dude is at peace. Like He's like, he's just standing, waiting for the train, waiting for the bus, but there's so much violence in his in his existence, right? Um, I wanted to, you know, ask you a question that I got from someone in the community. Um, I, I, I put the word out there, you know, if anybody has questions for Ruddy, hit me up. And she says, her name is uh, Adriana Martin, and she says, uh, Ruddy isn't afraid to go deep into issues that impact our humanity. So a question for you is, how do you take care of your spirit mm. while navigating and documenting the ugly parts of I, our society? I, uh, I have no idea. I, to be honest, I don't have a clue. But you, you still, you keep going. So, right, like they something, something. Those two people. So you're those driven by something that. Those two people, like, I don't like. As much as I'd like to have one one of those things on the wall, I'm not driven by it. Because this, look, I remember photographing Robert Frank. Put him up on my Instagram. People did not, I, people did not recognize him for four days. It took four days for somebody to be like, is that Robert? It means that this, this mortal coil is nothing. It's the work. You're true to the work. That is what lives on. And I don't necessarily think that it lives on in a binder. It lives on in the people's lives that you touch. It I mean, I'm sure everybody is going to walk away with at least something that I have said. And they're going to carry that. Even if it's the word pimento. <laughs> but you're going to carry that little seed with you for a while. And you might teach it to you're, you, the, the, you're, for the teachers that are here, you teach to your students. Um, I think, as, as we're losing time, I think one of the things that we have, we, have, we have left behind is this attention to detail. Like, the idea that in Jamaica, I grew up around a culture where it didn't matter what you got paid. It, it upset you, you go home and you complain, but once you're told to do the work, it was always, my, it was always 100%. My father always tell me, if you are, a, if all you are is a street sweeper, clean the street the best that you can. So when the queen comes to your country, guess who they call? You. And so I, when I, when I take an image inside of me is this image has to represent all of this. So I, I'm, I'm slow, I take my time, I look for context, and I try to put as much story into and texture into that picture. It's not just a, for me. There's so many others I want to speak about, but I'm going to jump ahead, right? I think this is one of the first images that I really uh, started to follow your work. I think this was back around in 2016. And um, it is. And pardon me. Um, I forget which one of our young brothers was murdered during this time because Mike Brown. Know, Mike Brown. 
Um, tell us the story about how you, you made this image. Um, just going to the Shakop Inn and first of all, seeing the cotton. Mm -hmm. um, I actually literally started to sing um, the song. The fabric of our lives. I, I was like, oh my God. Like, the song, actually, the jingle just came on in my head. Just like I saw it, the jingle came on. What, what was the first two words? The doom of cotton, the fabric of our lives. Yeah, that, that, that song. Like, it came on like, and while I'm watching it, I'm like, damn. And I'm like fighting the same feeling that I get because we have sugar cane, same thing. You know? I'm like, oh. This is what we had us. Mm. I see this dude walk out of a silo. And I'm like, what are you doing in the silo? So I go over there. They're actually making the silos into bread and breakfasts. And I was like, so somebody comes, goes to the bread and breakfast and wakes up. And I'm like, no, nah, man. And his name is Robert. And we started to talk, and I go, he goes, what are you doing? And I'm like, you know, I, I've been doing a story on Mike Brown. And as soon as I said that, he goes, dude, I'm with Mike Brown. Hands go up. And I go, do not move. Click. And I made this picture because of that conversation. Like, for him, it was work. And he understood when I said to him, dude, this is, this is what our ancestors had to. He got it. That picture. You know, I think this is one of those photos that seems so simple to make. People might see you post this image and think, I can go out there and do that. But maybe it, they can. Yeah, right. It's not to say that, you know, you're making work that is unattainable and it's not a slight on you at all, right? Because right. we all have we all have something within us that can make Powerful imagery, I don't, right? I don't, I don't suffer from that. Like, I, I don't believe that I've ever taken. I, I don't believe I've taken an image that nobody could take. What I know, though, is that you're not thinking Trayvon with his hoodie up, even though it's Mike Brown. Mm -hmm. So, I, in my mind, I'm like trying to say that it's not isolated. Yeah. Like it's Trayvon, it's Mike, it's it's all of the men and women who have died because of police. And something led your something directed your feet to be at a cotton field at the right time where this this young man was walking out mm -hmm. for you to think and put these all these different pieces of the puzzle together to make this image. Like mm -hmm. images don't just like where well, they do randomly happen, right? Because this is a random gotta, chance of event. But you have to see, see them. Yes. Yeah. And I know like as we walk around with our camera and we're in a space, we're in a certain environment our mind shifts into, okay, let me be open and aware of any possible images that can be made right now. See, I don't think your audience heard that. So let me, let me, let me, let me kind of break it down. You see the image before you see the image. Like, you got to know that that's an image. And it's not just, because I used to have this friend who used to say, he's no longer a friend, but he used to say, that's a hot image. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about an image that you know carries the weight of whatever you have here, whatever you have in here, that you know that that image is going to be able to go, go talk, go speak for you. Those images. You got you to, it's actually, it's such a, I want to say that, I mean, it's, it's so mythical when you say like you, you feel it, and, but it, there's kind of, you kind of, both, they both come together. You see it and you feel it and you go, that's, that's, that's an image. Mm -hmm. It comes with uh, practice. It comes with sensitivity to your environment and also... The reservoir. The reservoir. You need the reservoir. You need to know the images that have been made before you. You need to know who have made those images. You need to... Roy, like Roy de Carava is some... I mean, he's born de December 11th and born December 12th. Um, I went to meet his, his, his widow. Um, I went to meet his daughters. Like, we've had conversation on, on the stoop. Um, because I want to get into Roy's head. And he wasn't alive anymore. Um, I went to Roy's funeral. And around the same time, my father had passed. And it was in that moment that I, I learned a very valuable lesson that 
that we're all atoms. And it wasn't important. Like, it's not that important. And I had to learn that. Like, I can walk away from an image. It's not that important. But as long as I'm here, every image that I press through, every image I create or make, that is going to have this, this legacy, this voice, this come on, give voice, mm -hmm. is going to have that running through it. So that a hundred years from now, somebody's going to go, oh, yeah, I know this. I mean, looking at your work, it definitely, like, if I didn't know you, and we didn't have this conversation, and you all weren't here to hear this conversation, looking at your body of work, I get the sense that you have strong opinions about a lot of things. And you're able to put that into, put those opinions into the work that you make, into mm. the way that you see the world. Like, if we go, like, if you walk into a, a neighborhood and somebody else walks into a neighborhood, you're going to be focusing on different things than mm -hmm. the other person is, mm -hmm. right? And that's just the perspective that you bring to it. So you, your work is very, very opinionated. Mm -hmm. And I feel like is is you don't leave any room to doubt what it is that you want to express. Nina you know? Simone said an artist's role is to f document the times that they live in. Yes. Paraphrasing it. Um, um, she said it's, it's an obligation. You can't help but document this time that you live in. I can't, like, I cannot, I can't do anything else. Again, I have to go through some, I mean, there's some photos that I really do want to talk about. I wanted to talk about this photo, but because some of the earlier stuff was, like, pretty heavy, mm -hmm. I'm going to bypass that. I hope you don't mind this. No. Um, but just the way that you saw this photo come together is this, uh, is this young black man shirtless, has a scar Priest. on his, what was, what was that? Joseph Priest. Joseph Priest. That's his name. There's, the way that this image is composed is this crack in the wall that almost looks like a noose, right? And if you look all the way down, the, the, there's a line between his chest there's, uh, that, that goes into his abs, and then there's a scar on his ab. You keep going down, there's like the, the hem of his boxes that goes down to his zipper. It's just one line going straight through the entire image. Com like te Technically, it's a very, very solid image, but then we start looking at the details of it. It just is, a few words jump out to me when I see this is alarming. This image is very alarming to me, but it's also vulnerable because this, 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 this man allowed you to photograph him in this, in his state without a shirt on, um, and it's painful, but it's also honest. And I feel like it takes a certain type of personality to get all of those things, all of those emotions in the image. Um, I'm going to move on from it, though. All right, I just it. want to comment on it. No, we're good. Um, same here. It feels just more violence, but you're still able to disarm these 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 young people who you know, might not be as vulnerable with somebody else, right? So, again, that's a testament to your approach uh, and to, like, your upbringing. Um, but this image I wanted to speak to in particular because mm -hmm. I don't know if you all could see it, but, you know, Ruddy is really good at dropping those those clues, those, like, little hints. It's almost like you're, you're a trickster, like, a, you, you have, like, this jokester personality to you, right? Where, and again, you're always able to find like these young, why is everybody without a shirt, bro? Like, <laughs> I have no idea. What's happening, man? But, you know, this young man uh, with a baby carrier, with his baby, and in the corner is a family dollar, but you got the family part of it. And I don't know if y'all saw that, right? But, um, I'm like, yo, that's a that's a trickster move, right? Like, I feel like, and it's in a good way, right? I feel like did you see, you, you did don't. Did you see the sale? Mm. Yep. Yeah. You know, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna round it out 
right? You know, um, I know there was, you, you know, you're able to go into a lot of painful situations, a lot of controversial, uh, sometimes unsafe situations, and still come out with amazing images. Um, but I want to round it out and speak a little bit about family. I know you have two sons, right? Um, what do you, like, how do you balance being a father with the kind of work that you make? And I, I'm, I'm asking that question as a, as a father. I'm their teacher. As well. um, I don't, I have never left it up to the eight hours that they spend in school mm -hmm. to be their, their teacher. Um, I've also, I've also been taught by them. I've allowed, one thing that I've, 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 I was never very good at is listening to somebody else tell me what I think I spend most of my life trying to learn. So let's say uh, I've, I've been trying to learn to ride a bike, a motorcycle, and my son will come, come around because he's, he's new age. He, and he goes, Dad, but if you put something else on this, like I've learned how to, to listen to them, listen to the echo, and hear what comes back. But um, I believe that I, I, do the, I do the same thing that my mom did to me, and, and, and that is to give them the tools of, I remember even before, there's a movie by a, a woman, a woman photographer, white woman. She did a, a series on, on um, oh my God. She did, she did a series on girl, girl culture. That was one of her books. And then she also did a documentary on when boys say, I can do it like a girl. What's that saying? Like a girl. Yeah, you, th you throw like a girl. Like, I remember the first time my, my, my son said something like, and I was like, dude, do you know me, how many girls can run faster than you right now? <laughs> like, I, like, like I, I, I see myself doing what my mom did, and that is to, to let them understand that everybody's voice is as important as yours. That was a very hard lesson for me um, because of how I grew up. My mom made my voice the voice in the house. Because my father was present, but not present. Um, he was an alcoholic. So she gave me responsibility. So I, I grew up having this voice. Like, my voice is important. But then having to, I, I keep saying to people that you do not know love until you have kids. Facts. Um, and you'll ask me, what do I mean by that? Because your kid is the only person that can throw this phone across the room. And you look like you're going to kill him, but you go, Next time. That love is different. And that, that love has taught me how to listen. If it has done nothing else, it has taught me how to be more patient, to listen, to like, to like, to be more patient. To like, he's not, my, 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 my Mosey is like, like he doesn't get it. Like he takes him, I remember when he was a, a little kid, the doctor would say, you know, Mosey's supposed to be lifting the phone now, and Mosey would lift, lift the phone two weeks later. He's always like that. Everything, he gets everything two weeks later. So sometimes I'll tell him no, and then I'll go stand up two weeks later, and I'll wait for him to. And he'll, of course, he'll pass me by like, that. I got it. I'm lifting my phone. That's what, that has been such an important part in my development. Like, figuring out a different type of love, figuring out how to be, a, a teacher, but also a student at the same time, figuring how I can't always use the rah-rah tone that you can crush this human being. Yeah. And, I, and I realize that I take that, I'm learning how to take that out into, because you piss me off, you're going to get the rah-rah already. I have to learn to sometimes, you don't need, no, it's okay, I can walk off. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I'm learning. And I think the more you grow as a human, I've always said this, uh, the better you are as a human, the better photographer you are. Yes. It's not the other way around. Photography does not make, it's not, it's not that you go to Africa, and you go to India, and you go to Asia, and you go in the South, and your relationship with the, the work that you do makes you a better photographer. No, you go there and you take shitty pictures the same. You have to work on you 
go out into these communities and make better images. So this, the, 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 the polishing starts here. And that's what being a father has helped me to become. Yeah, man, I, I resonate with that 100%. Um, I have one last question for you. Um, this one? Hmm? This guy? Well, yeah, I love the, you know, again, the vulnerability, uh, the lighting. This, this guy is showing us um, a scar on his chest, right? Um, I've heard you mention in an interview that a good image makes you cry, Ooh. right? And I want to ask you why, and when was the last time you cried over an image? Oh man, I almost cried. I almost cried for Robert just now, and I did not make a good image. Um, I think I don't. Again, it's not the image that makes me cry; it's the story. Mm -hmm. It's it's the reality of the situation. Um, he's close, about seventy-four years old, double bypass. And he's working. He could not lay in bed. That's why he's showing me this card. That this, like if you look, you can still see the stitches hole in his chest. Mm -hmm. um, right. Look, the, the band is still on his hand. Like he was working. He was working because he doesn't have anybody to take care of him, and he needs food. He needs to pay his rent, and. It's the story that gets me. The image, I look, look, there are like tons of images. I don't consider my images special. I consider the stories that I tell special. So I have to challenge that a little bit because you are the one, as a photographer, you are the one who knows the stories, mm -hmm. right? So you can see the image and know and feel the story in that image more than the image itself, but for those of us who weren't there when the image was made, we get to sort of experience that story through the images that you make. Mm -hmm. So there is some power in that, you know. Um, and, you know, I just want to thank you for um, being open to share all of these different stories. Um, you know, very powerful work. Um, it's an honor. I, I definitely, um, you know, held back a few tears um, when you told me that the, the young brother is no longer with us. Um, so, you know, um, yeah, some people in the audience are sharing that same sentiment. So, Ruddy, I appreciate you for, for coming through from Cleveland back to New York I know. and sharing your stories and your words with us. And um, I think we're over time, so I don't know if we have time for Q&A, but I just want to say... Uh, it's the best part. All right. Do we, does anybody have a few questions? Hit me. Yes, sir. Hold on one second. Uh, first of all, thank you both for uh, having this event. I went to um, an exhibit this past weekend where the photographer Howard Cash spoke about the importance of photographers knowing how to speak about the work. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about the importance of writing, right? And I just wanted to know if you had any tips about, um, for photographers, to become better at writing about their work? Um, I would actually say it's easy. It's actually easy. If you can answer why you're taking the picture, you can always talk about it. You can re-engineer. If, if, if I know why I'm taking a picture of this brother, if I know exactly why, like they're, they're, I have a reason, then it becomes easier to know re-engineer the, the answer. It's, it, it's easy to tell you why. But if you go there and you're just clicking, then you don't have to go make up a reason. So for me, it, it was literally going back to 4 by 5 where it was slow, where it was a thought. Like the image came from a thought or the image gave me a thought while I'm standing there trying to, why am I here? The brother with the, the, the line behind his head, that came after five images. I went there, and, and, and I'm, I'm like, can I take your photograph? And he said, yes. And immediately he goes, and he's giving me West Side. And I'm, I'm in his hood, surrounded by his boys with their machine. I'm going to do what he says, click. But I wasn't happy. 
And he kept saying, one more. And I'm like, dude, these cost $20 a pop. I'm like, I can't, I can't afford this. But he goes, one more. And after the fourth one, I'm like, dude, I'm done. He goes, no, 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 one more. And he did that. And I remember saying to him, if you move, I'm going to kill you. And I go, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. But that's the image I wanted all along. I didn't see this until the fourth one. I saw the line. But time, when you spend time, the image reveals itself. And if you can answer the why, like why am I taking this? Why do I want the image of this dude? I'm in the south, so I'm looking for, for, for the south. And then I saw the line, and I'm like, you know, you know how many lynchings they had in the south? It was done. I didn't, that's it. So somebody asked me about this image, I can say, so it's the why. Sam hears me. He'll tell you. Sam is a young photographer, blooming photographer in Cleveland. He asks me anything he asks me, wherever. I always ask him, why? Because if you can answer why, you can, you can talk about the image. You're welcome. Yes, sir. You and seeing the work and it's I'm gaining so much right now for sure. Um, I have two questions, but I'm gonna do one. Hit me. Um, you know, I was in Jamaica in January on for New Year's, and I was in Kingston for the first time. And I, my parents were saying, "Never." I've, it was my first time in Kingston. They were saying, "Never go to Kingston because it's such and such." We're from Saint Elizabeth. It's very different. But I was like stuck in the house. So I was like, "Let me get out here and like see the area." I had my camera too, and I was moving through some parts that were, you know, the trenches. And I, I saw inspiration, so much life, that I really wanted to photograph, but I, I, I heard my, my parents in the background. And I'm wondering, like, when, when, when you went about, like, trying to find your way through these places, how did you undo? Because you're, do, you're, you're doing a work of finding the stories, but also undoing a lot of your own, like, stories and, and mythology about Love that word. You know what I'm saying. Yeah, the mythologies of which we are wicked and this, that, the third, which mm -hmm. I think about often. Mm -hmm. How do you navigate that growth while offer, offering that pathway for others at the same time? Okay. Yeah. We go back to the word. Why and what do you have to say? Um, you, you're, you're Jamaican? Mm. So there's a saying, if you don't have something good to say about somebody, you don't say nothing. So a lot of people might look at that and say you're, you're, you're censoring. But for me, look at all these books. There's, there has been enough of the other stuff. So they don't need my contribution. I can find out a little one nugget. And, and in terms of going through the trenches, it's always good. Dude, like, find out who lives in the trenches. What I, have, what I did... To do like I have a dance hall series that I've wor I've been working on. There's always a Don. Find him without cameras. Right. Explain to him that you have this series that you're working on. Move from there. You should ask a second one, because because everybody look everybody look quiet. Number number two is you know. I, I wanted to talk to the, about this one-on-one, -on -one, you know, if you had the space, but like uh, industry, and I feel like the black body is constantly used as aesthetic device for branding. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you see, it's like this model from South Sudan, but they never talk about what's going on in South Sudan, mm -hmm. but they find the darkest skin possible. It mm -hmm. creates impact. It pisses me off. It's terrible. It pisses me off. So how do you hold that anger, you know, because like I know you have contemporaries. Additionally, how do you navigate the, the commercial see realm? them. Yeah, yeah. You just what do, what do you mean by see them? They're on Instagram. Like, how do, how do you respond? Work. How do you respond though? Uh, it did, uh, you know, when I was younger, yeah, I would spit. Right, right. And I realized that spitting cost me. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. and I can because because I do not fear going back to this place. Mm -hmm. I remember going to Eddie Adams to do one of these, mm -hmm. and 
I followed Nakwe as a photographer. Like, I don't know, everybody know who James Nakwe is? This man, what you just say? What you just say? You don't know who James Nakwe is? Righty down that tea. Uno be, uno, uno, uno si, uno si no phone, what go on? James Nakwe, Jim, okay, so, I want, because, 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 only skeleton, you know what I'm saying? But, 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 he's regarded as the godfather of photojournalism. This Robert Frank, who's like, 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 Robert started it, Nakwe, Made it. Just go look. Um, he has a he has a documentary also that you should watch. No 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 no. Um, but where was I going with Nak? So I followed Nakwe. But when I looked in my audience, there were a hundred photographers, one black one. Ichop, don't go back long lesson. He wasn't even in the front. So me can go. So bro. Good to see you. He was all the way in the back. So I immediately disregarded my, so I asked the audience a question. I said, how many of you guys want to photograph black subject matter? How many people do you think hands went up? Everybody. Everybody. I said, all right, if you all want to do that, could somebody tell me what Juneteenth is? How many think? People answered, not a soul. So I said, why do you think that you have the authority, the knowledge base to go photograph with Um. thing? Suffice to say, Eddie Adams have never invited me back. So I understand that when you speak, there's a sacrifice to it. But my mommy always said, see this thing here? It's one of the most powerful things in the world. And when you get one, you're using. And I think that's what I did. Um, not Gia, the same thing. Like, man, burn. And I remember coming off the stage in Not Gia, and I got a text from a friend saying, you've burnt another bridge. But there was this photographer, very famous wildlife photographer, who came and showed elephants that, that were on platform that he hundred and something thousand dollar platforms he said when I drove in the truck there were kids running up because we had food in the truck I mean here you say you feed the community you know left no money but you built a hundred and something thousand dollar platform to put your elephant on so you could photograph the elephant and leave so the next day I went up and I again ignored my no actually we all got 45 minutes and I said, I'm going to use 15 minutes out of my 45 minutes to talk about what, we, what, we, what you saw last night. So it is important to speak up. I would say, as a young photographer coming, be, be mindful that it does affect the, who embrace you after. But I can't help it. Like, I, I believe that I'm, I'm his advocate. Like, we should have um, universal health, health care. We should have um, um, an off weight with a kid with the, the chain. In that neighborhood, all the warehouses, tell me I'm lying, all the warehouses that feed Cleveland are on along that road. But there's no supermarket in a, around off it. There's only a gas station and a, another little bodega type. So all they eat is Doritos, da, 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 processed food. You hear what I said? The food that feed Cleveland, that means Dave's, all the supermarkets get food. And the warehouses are along the, the projects. But they don't get none of that food. Right, 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 right. Same thing, same thing. So for me, we have, we as artists, Nina again, Mama Nina say, you document the times you live in. Anybody else can go photograph Afrofuturism. I, I, don't, eh. 
I'm dealing in Afro-presentism. I, 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 I can't, because I can conceive of a different Africa than you. My Africa is not a, a, a dark-skinned Sudanese person in pretty clothes in the hood. That's not my, 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 my Afro is accepting everybody that's in this room, no matter what they look like. And I think that's why until we create more platforms that celebrate our work, our con contributions, um, we can talk about these things without fear of being reprimanded, fear of being blackballed or burning any bridges, you know what I mean? Um, because everybody has a voice in this, man. So, Ruddy, very, really, really, really appreciate your honesty and, and how forthright you are with the work that you do. and how steadfast you are in, in, in sticking to your guns, man. So uh, that's a wrap for this episode. Stick, sticking with the cameras. We're sticking leaving, with the, cameras. We're leaving the gun. Uh, indeed, indeed. We, right. And thank you, everybody. That's a wrap for this uh, episode of Black Shutter Podcast. But uh, until next time, peace. Thank you, guys.